Good evening. Welcome to Church Wigan Life. It's great to have you with us once again. My name is Will, and um, tonight we're going to be joined later by Bishop Paul to conclude this summer series um, that we've been led by the senior leaders of the Diocese of Liverpool. So as we gather together to worship tonight, let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your love and your grace. Lord, we thank you for your constant mercy. Lord, we thank you that you can transform every situation and any circumstance. So Lord, as we gather tonight to worship you, physically distanced but digitally together, Lord, we pray that we would know the transforming power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, that we would worship you in spirit and in truth and give you glory and honour and praise. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to introduce to you a song that might be unfamiliar, um, but it's a great song to bring praise to God, and it's called Graves into Gardens. I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. Man's empty place, treasures of faith, never enough. You came alive, me back together. Every desire is now satisfied, fearing your love. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. I'm not afraid to show you my weakness, my failures and flaws, but you've seen them all, you still call me friend. He's the God of the mountain, He's the God of the valley, and there's not a place Mercy and grace will find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Better than you, oh, there's nothing Better than you, oh, there's nothing Nothing is better than you You turn morning to dancing You get beauty for ashes you turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing. You get beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing. 
better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you, oh, there's nothing better than you, Lord, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. Listen to God. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. You're the only one who can. So, Lord, we thank you for your presence with us. Lord, we thank you that you give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. And, Lord, tonight we acknowledge and we confess that you are the only one who can. Lord, that there is no one like you. And you are worthy of all honor and glory and praise. Amen. Uh, reading this evening comes from Matthew's Gospel, and we're reading from chapter 16, beginning at verse 21. From that time on, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. For you are set in your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for the sake, for my sake, will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what has been done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So just before we hear from Bishop Paul, I uh, invite Dolores to come back and to pray for us. God of constant mercy, who sent your Son to save us, remind us of your goodness. Increase your grace within us. Thank our thankfulness may grow. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you for the opportunity to connect with you and to serve the churches in this holiday month. This is the last of a series of sermons that myself and Bishop Bev and the Archdeacons and Dean Sue have put together really in the hope that your own local ministers will be able to have some rest and refreshment. We know how hard they've been working uh, all the way through this pandemic ever since March when everything seems to have changed for the churches. And we wanted to give them the opportunity to rest so that when we come to uh, the autumn, uh, we'll be able, as my friend Stephen Hans says, to face it with our best selves. 
And I pray that for you and for all your community as well as for your ministers. Because this is a stressful and a painful time. And the gospel today also speaks of stress and pain as Jesus shares with his friends the cost of his faithfulness to God's call. The road to resurrection runs to the cross and as Jesus explains this, his words prove too much for Simon Peter. Let's remember the context of this passage. Literally a couple of verses before, Jesus had said this to Simon, I tell you, you're Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Wonderful words of affirmation and upbuilding. And it's just possible that those words have gone to Peter's head. There are a few examples in scripture of the blessings of God going to people's heads. For example, from the Old Testament, in 1 Kings chapter 18, the prophet Elijah gets himself into a struggle with the many prophets of Baal. And they have a, a sort of an encounter. And Elijah says, my God is the true God. And he asks God to demonstrate that. And God responds, you'll remember in the story, fire falls from heaven and burns up the sacrifice. Elijah is vindicated. And indeed, in his, in his relief at having been vindicated, he turns to violence and those prophets of the false god Baal are all killed. There's Elijah, he's proved his power it's gone to his head. And in the next chapter, 1 Kings chapter 19, he hears that Jezebel, the queen, has determined to kill him and he's suddenly overcome with fear. And he runs away. And he says to God, take my life, God. It's all gone for me. Somehow the power and the blessing and the affirmation of God have turned to ashes in his mouth. And in the New Testament, we can see perhaps the reason for that, which is that the way to true life is the way of the cross, and the way of the cross is to put others first. Affirmation and power from God are given us for a purpose, not simply for their own sakes. Otherwise, we wander from the path so back to Peter, he having received the blessing of affirmation, when Jesus begins to speak about Jesus' own journey to suffering, Peter steps in. Oh no, Lord, that will never happen to you. It should not happen to you. Don't go that way, even though your father may have called you. Jesus turns to Peter, the very one that he's just affirmed. And he says, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter is rebuked because he wants Jesus to avoid the cross. And we may wonder why he faces such a fierce rebuke when all he's doing is trying to spare pain to look after his friend. But the answer is given in the next verse where the writer tells us that Jesus had a wider message for his disciples. If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. And he goes on to say, for those who save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. In other words, Peter's desire that Jesus should avoid suffering goes against the grain, not just for Jesus, but for Peter himself and for any of us who might want to follow Jesus. It's not that God wants us to suffer because he's got it in for us. It's that the calling on us is to step out of our comfort zone and to enter a path of self-giving, which needs to be embraced and not resisted, because life is found there 
and nowhere else. In this Diocese of Liverpool, we say, we're asking God for a bigger church to make a bigger difference. And we say, more people knowing Jesus, more justice in the world. In other words, we set ourselves on a path. We're asking God. The path begins by asking, depending on God, accepting that we don't have the strength. It's only God who can help us. And in that help from God, we're called to share our faith and to see justice done. And all of that involves putting others first, following Jesus on that path that leads away from our own comfort and our own self-confidence and towards following Jesus, not only on the hills of joy and life, but into the valley. The whole world is entering the valley as this virus runs around. And as that pain spreads, we can stand for the sake of others and freely say, we're there for you. We're surrounded by people, of course not all Christians, key workers and others, whose lives day by day are spent being there for other people and who run many of them the risks that come with being there for others. We seek to extend care and safety and assurance to our neighbours. And we recognise that care and safety and assurance when we see it. We give thanks and praise to God for those others and when we ourselves can see that we're resisting the temptation to despair the temptation to become angry, the temptation to blame others. Living lives of worship and service, we're seeking always to put others first and to care for them and their well-being. Loving God as we do, we seek to share that love and to speak of it and to speak of Jesus who leads to that love and to work for justice and to feed people, and to spend our lives in their service. Whether they're hungry for God or for bread, we will seek to feed them. It doesn't add up to a masochistic lifestyle of suffering and gloom. It can bring us to a place of extraordinary fruitfulness and lightness and joy. But we reach that place by putting God and others first, the way which the Bible describes as the way of the cross. Now my prayer for you is that you reach that place of lightness and fruitfulness and joy by following, by following Jesus and by standing in company with all those in your community who follow him too. And then you'll be able to be there for the frightened and the hungry and the bereaved and the lost and to give yourself to them in service for the sake of love. I thank you again for all that you and your community have already done to extend love and life and care to your neighbourhood and those you love in this pandemic. And I pray for you that you'll continue down that road, just as I ask your prayers for me and all my colleagues in the diocese, that God will give us strength to walk that road too. May God bless you and protect you as you serve and love. And may the affirmation and strength of God, which is so freely given, lead you to follow, to be there for others first. On this Sunday and on into this coming autumn and forever. Amen. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God our Saviour, through Jesus Christ our Lord, glory, majesty, dominion and authority 
for all time and now and forever. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and please come back next week. Bye.